But it hasn't always been about winning. The roar of the crowd, great sponsor partnerships, and celebrating the spoils of victory. John Force Racing and its history runs a lot deeper than most people realize. Its origins a lot more humble than most people could imagine. Though John Force Racing now boasts 16 NHRA championships, numerous speed records, two incredible facilities that cover over 220,000 square feet, and 10 tractor-trailer trucks, it didn't all start out that way. In fact, John Force and John Force Racing and its struggle to gain notoriety and support is quite a different story. A story of poverty, of hope and determination, of life's unforgiving challenges, and of life's magnificent rewards. It's about how talent and ambition triumphed when John Force Racing and Castrol teamed up together to make history. We were poor. Our t entire regimen for a week at a time was beans and potatoes. I mean, we were poor, okay? Uh, to think that that all that's happened up till today could have possibly happened wasn't something that we even dreamed about. Well, John was the youngest of five. So when I remember him, my first memories of when he was a toddler. And back in those days, we were quite poor and we worked in the fields of Southern California picking crops. And uh, one of the jobs I remember we had was picking strawberries and those strawberry rows went on forever. And John was just a toddler, so my mom my dad and myself and my other brothers, we would, we would work in the fields. But John being the baby, he would have to go out with us because there was no one else to watch him. And so what my mom would do is she would tie a rock to him on a short uh, rope, and that way he couldn't wander off. He basically played in the dirt all day long. John being the sickly one, I, I, I took care of him. We were so poor that we couldn't live in a town. We lived out in the woods, so consequently we had no friends. And the only friends we had was each other. Okay, so John and I grew a bond. Uh, from the very early years, John had a lot of tenacity and a lot of self-confidence, even when he was only nine or 10 years old. You could see it in how he challenged life and he took on projects and did things. Uh, we were living in a logging camp one time that was 20 miles away from the nearest town. And John decided that he wanted to play little league football. I used to hitchhike 20 miles in the snow to go up I know this is the old story, but true. In the snow, hitchhike down a, a log road to get from, from uh, Klamath Glen up to, to Crescent City where they played Pop Warner football. Because if I could put on a helmet and I could have tackling pads, I didn't have to have the speed of a runner. I could just be tough and hit people head on, things they didn't do in flag football because they don't tackle in flag football. Okay, the point is, I found that the chair of the crowd, the football helmet, and even though I was handicapped, that I could do something. And that was my dream, was to be a football player. But I realized being a pro was never gonna happen. So what was the next thing where I could wear a helmet and have the chair of the crowd? It was never about money. I could get in a race car, because a race car did the running for me. And I become one of the greatest of all time. Let's pat ourselves on the shoulder here. Johnny guy, but the truth is the car did the running. So racing made sense to me. No matter hard, how hard it was, how much you got hungry, how much you couldn't pay your bills, you could put on that helmet, and when you walked out in that stadium, the cheer of the crowd to this day makes the hair stand up on the, on the back of my neck. And then somebody said, boy, somebody ought to paint a sign on you, because somebody will give you money for what you do. Hey, they'll pay a clown, well, I was a clown for a lot of years, but when I got with Castrol, we got dead serious. And then we started winning, and it's been a home run ever since. Long before John Force Racing and Castrol became a successful team, John knew he needed help, and knew exactly who he could turn to to get his racing career off the ground and running. Well, the first funny car actually was built uh, by uh, John and Louie and Mike and Raj. This is about 1973, 74. And they had uh, put together parts and pieces that they'd, they'd picked up from all over. Uh, they were both truck drivers. 
And what they would do is they would work all day and then the first thing they got off uh, duty, they would come straight to my house and I let them use my garage and they would go out there and they would work on that car till midnight, two o'clock in the morning sometimes, trying to get it started, get it to run. And the time was coming, we felt it building and it got giddy as school kids, it got giddy as school kids. Man, we're really good. We're going to the big time. To us, it was the big time. We never thought about the guys that were running world's feed limits and, and had sponsors and big fancy rigs. But I'll never forget uh, the week before going to, to Orange County. We were going to Orange County, Orange County. It's like ice cream, ice cream. You know what I mean? And it was. It, was, it, it sounds childish now, but it was our world, and that's all we knew. We didn't go to the movies then. We didn't go to baseball games. We didn't play football, you know. We didn't go to church on Sunday. We went and worked on our race car, and it was our whole world, and it was all we had. And uh, I was not, I, I was of the mindset that I was not gonna quit. And John, you, you couldn't even say that to him. What are you, crazy? You're go, kid, let's go. I sit him down that racetrack at, at, uh, at Orange County, and I'll never forget it, I was in the back of the pickup truck, and John, the, the engine exploded, and John made a turn off of the racetrack. In the dark, there were a few lights, and I was so scared. This is a true story. When we went by, the car had gone around to the end of the guardrail and back up the return road, and we're still 200 feet from where we could turn around. I stepped out of the truck. S scabbed me up so bad, it wasn't a thought, you know? Uh, I literally just bailed out of the truck. It was, there he was, and I just stepped out of the truck, and we were going probably 50 miles an hour. This thing blew up, it's on fire. Motor's out front, he thinks I'm dead. I get off the road down there in the dirt, I crash, but I was okay. I'm out of the car brushing up, and here comes a pickup truck. And I'm like, hey, I got to the other end, that was something, Louie, because Louie built all the motors, he did everything. And here he come, Louie jumped out of the side of the truck to get to me, like he was gonna do something when he got there, right? Fire crew was already there. Louis feet were running 100 miles an hour, and then he realized the truck was going faster than him. And he went end over end. And when he stood up, Louie was all bloody, all beat up, and I'm like, Jesus. And he ran up, are you okay, brother? I said, I'm fine. And he was a mess. He goes, man, that was mentioned. You see how ice flames was clear from over the car? He's all oiled down, skin's all burnt, had red blisters on his cheeks, because we didn't have the kind of safety equipment we have now. You know what I told him, son? This is a bad son of a bitch. I'm teamed up with the right guy. We'll go far. Well, if it wasn't for Louie, I wouldn't have been here. But Louie was always there to make sure that, that, that I would get that, <clears throat> whatever I needed. And then when there was a fist fight, Louie was right in the middle of it. Always protecting me, that's why I love him. Then what I started doing was being careful about how I built my engines so he wouldn't get hurt. The first race was the, was the biggest one in our lives, though, I think, uh, as far as getting past the, the semi-fantasy, uh, uh, surreal world of wanting to go somewhere and telling yourself, I can do it, and deep down inside, everything practical says you're not gonna do it, and ignoring that, and ignoring that. And when they laughed at us and called us leakers, and told us, get that junk off the racetrack, didn't even hurt our feelings, okay. We'll fix it and we'll be back. Don't come back. You know, we actually got 86 from, from San Gabriel. They wouldn't let us come back there and race because we'd blow our engines in the oil, we'd go everywhere and the guys were racing, they'd all hate us. He was in a ball of flames or some catastrophe every single run and he didn't know what he was doing and his crew was free and, you know, he had very little sponsorship and it really looked like he was going nowhere. But the one thing he did have was the dream and the hard work ethics to make it happen. Well, the reason he crashed so many times was because he was using junk parts. He wanted to race bad, but he just didn't have the money to finance a real good car. John was always the hard issue in this and like he never gave up. And sometimes I'd say, we could have a regular life, let's just get a job. No, there was never, never, ever anything to do with an ego or vanity or anything like that. It wasn't anything, because we didn't care about the outside world. It was me and him and that racetrack and going fast. And when somebody would get in his face, he would say, okay, 
You're right today, but I'll be back. He's like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know. We'll be back here and we're gonna, we'll kick your ass. When he first started out, he was always on a limited budget. A lot of times he used my dad's credit card just to get a tank of gas to get back to a location to race. And when he, once he got there, he would have to find a sponsor that would give him enough money to get back. He gives me too much credit. Uh, he made it easy to follow him because he was a star. Uh, John was a star of everybody that ever worked for him because he would get you to go the distance without a real reason. And then on the way home, suffer. Before you got back to Los Angeles, car burnt to the ground, tires flat, hadn't eaten in two days. He would tell you, next week, let me tell you how it's gonna happen. And he had turned around half the time when he was driving and he would start telling you how we were gonna put this thing back together and how next time it'll be different We'll, we'll not be eating this. We'll not be eating them green baloney sandwiches. We sold tires right off the side of the highway, out in the middle of Texas. We, you know, we sold nitromethane, anything we had in the trailer that we could sell. There were quite a few times when I can remember when we wouldn't eat for two or three days, and we literally would go out and hide somewhere where nobody was and park our trailer, and we'd sleep on the tailgate of the trailer, five of us guys in a pickup truck, and we would spend 11 months on the road uh, in a two, in a dually pickup truck, and uh, uh, that was how bad that we wanted to go racing. And those guys that were in the truck with us were guys who had families and jobs at home that they BS their boss into believing that they had a critical situation that they couldn't deny, and they would end up in the middle of John and I's dream. And John would always keep the dream going. At the end of the day, it was just a process of what we did, getting the 18 wheeler. He was with Ashley uh, in a truck stop uh, when she was a baby and Lori was riding in the sleeper and we were running out of diesel fuel. And Louie got out and talked this trucker into giving us gas or the baby was gonna freeze to death because we were out of money. So that was the early days of struggle. And there's a million cars in there that we crashed, rolled fuel alders over end over end. Burn them up. Burn them up, set them on fire, wheel deal hustle, that's how you did it. But along the way, those were the good days you know what I mean? Castro come along later, and this is the good life. You know what I mean? Actually getting a paycheck to do what you used to do just as a hobby. I told him I thought it was foolish, and I thought he was going to kill himself doing this because he was so bad. And for the first couple of years, he was probably the worst car out there on the circuit. He was absolutely horrible. <laughs> and his team, like I was a team member, what do I know about race cars? He had me packing parachutes. Um, I backed up the race car, mixed the fuel. You know, anybody who was f a friend of his and was free labor, they were on the crew. There's no comparison to how it was in the early days because we were starving to death. When we say hot bologna sandwiches, we kept them under the seat of the truck. My kids can't even fathom what it was like when they got lounges and big 18-wheeler transporters and air conditions and big screen TVs and we lived out of a pickup truck. His personality really connects with the consumer. He, uh, he was a truck driver when he was growing up, and he never has lost sight of where he came from and that those are the people that make all this possible. I, I always compare it to, to his choice of foods. We have a gourmet chef that travels with us now, and, and he cooks meals that you would get in an in a upscale restaurant. But John still prefers the standards that he grew up with. He, fried bologna sandwiches, cheeseburgers, hot dogs, tuna fish sandwiches, and peanut butter. And John's loyalty is, you know, unquestioned. Uh, loyalty to his fans, loyalty to his sponsors, loyalty to his team. Um, I think, you know, that loyalty factor is something I think that'll, that also will stand out from a standpoint of fans, sponsors, everyone is aligned that, uh, you know, he is, uh, uh, quite a representative to have a, as a sponsorship partner. People say, why do you love the fans? The fans used to feed us. Where well, the fans would come to the ropes to the other race teams, stuff. they were famous racers, they were winning. Uh, you know, they'd sign an autograph, say hi. We'd spend all day talking to them because we knew if we talked enough, they'd bring us Show back Show them dinner. how stuff worked. <clears throat> oh, yeah. it's it's Won the people over right away. Just being did. part of that deal with them. He understands the importance of retaining our customers. And at the end of the day, it comes down to understanding the importance of selling our product. I think early on in his career, before he had achieved anything, 
he recognized that even though he wasn't a very good racer at the time, that he had a gift for gab and that he could attract a crowd simply by telling stories. And, and really, at that point in his career, he would engage fans at the ropes and, and tell them how hard, off the, hard up the race team was. And they'd bring food and everything.